The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small, portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts. Plus, they're IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials, order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Hello and welcome to the Batteries Included podcast. It's April the 19th, 2024, and this is episode number 33 Thank you very much for joining us. On today's show, we'll be talking about the, the upgrades coming to the Ford Mustang Mach-E for 2024 with its chief engineer, Donna Dixon, Kyle driving the Hyundai Ioniq 5N, the debut of the Maserati Gran Cabrio Fulgore, and of course, much, much more. I'm Dominic Gioni. Joining us today is the expeditious Mr. Tom Malogny, senior editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge. We also have the mesmerizing Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Outspec Studios, where he produces high voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. He'll be joining us in just a little bit. Uh, but we were very pleased today to be joined by our special guest, Donna Dixon from the Ford Motor Company. She is the chief engineer of the Ford Mustang Mach-E. So hi there, everybody. Good to see Hi, you everybody. all. Hey, thanks for having me. It was nice to meet you there, Donna. And I believe you, we've met Kyle before and Hi, Tom Kyle. briefly. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I believe we only have you, Donna, for like uh, maybe 20 minutes. So I guess let's dive right into this Ford Mustang Mach-E and the changes coming to the 2024 model year. So yeah. The, uh, Oh, I don't know if you have any questions or you want me to just jump in. Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've got I'll get a little intro here for you just to okay. set you up. Uh, Right, so the uh, Mustang Mach-E first went on sale in December of 2020, I believe. So it's only been out for about three years and a bit, but the technology is evolving pretty quickly. So the 2024 model year is getting significant updates, including, of course, the addition of the very special Mach-E Rally to the lineup. Um, so please feel free to uh, correct me if I get any of this wrong, but I believe the 2024 model year also gets faster DC charging speeds Correct. New rear electric motors designed in-house at Ford, more range, and the GT gets the, an optional performance upgrade, which is standard on the Mach-E, but adds 100 foot-pound of torque, makes it quicker than Tesla Model Y performance. So we're talking 3.3, 0 to 60s, and 11.8 second quarter miles. So there's, there's quite a bit in, in there, but maybe we could start with the battery and the DC charging. So, um, yes. so can we... So Go ahead. Um, you, uh... you nailed everything on the product. Um, <laughs> oh, really? We have so much going on. Um, right. And I, I do just want to say thank you to the entire Maki team. Um, we have really uh, embraced always on and always listening to our customers. And we have really evolved this product since we originally launched it in December of 20. Um, for 24, um, batteries remain the same. Um, we, we put in that, that, that new internal um, Ford produced motor. So that's where we're getting a lot of the performance improvements. We've changed um, some of our powertrain controls to open up some of the areas as well that's helped kind of on, um, you know, the, the charge times and all of that has helped, you know, really see range improvements across all of our variants. Um, so you know, just a lot has gone gone into um, this 24 prod product. Mm. But really, I mean, it's kind of building on things that we've done. You know, we went with a different standard range um, battery in, in 23, 23 and a half. We upgraded the cooling at that time um, for 23. So we're always looking to see what else we can, we can do on this product. And I, I am absolutely so proud of 24. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, the customers talk to us and we're, we're listening and improved all the areas that they have told us that, you know, we needed to just see if we could do, you know, give them a little bit more. And we have, 
I think you have a picture up of um, the bronze package as well. So we have three new colors in 24, and this is a new package as well with the eruption green, with the bronze accent on the grill and the bronze accents on the, the badging and the wheels. So um, it, it's it, there's a lot to pick from in 24. Yeah, that looks fantastic, that green green and gold. I um, love it. It's my it's, car, it's, my next car. <laughs> All right. So the um, the, the, the battery and the DC charging speed has really, really decreased. Uh, you've done quite a job there. So can you tell us if that's, so I guess that's the same hardware, the same cells that you're using. So is it a software change that's getting you yeah, that improved charging? It's a, it, it's, it's definitely of the powertrain controls that we have, um, we have tuned differently um, and, and that has helped. We have, if you were to look at it, we maybe not have, you know, I think if you looked at it, we have over time improved, but this is like the biggest step that we've taken for 24. All right. Um, so you say that performance upgrade includes, um, let's see, actually, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I, I wanted to actually talk about the electric motors, the new electric rear motors a little bit. So they were designed in-house, I believe, right? It is. So we actually took um, a family of motor. Um, this motor is in our Lightning. Okay. Um, and, you know, and it was planned going going forward into our, our new vehicles as well. Um, we saw a lot of benefits to, to help on, on performance, to help improve our cost position, because we know how, how pricing and cost is is just so critical for our EV um, customers right now. And, and then just bring, we were able to bring other, you know, purchase commodities that, you know, that we would normally buy in house as well. So we share a lot of those components with um, the lightning. It helps on scale and where we buy, you know, how we buy um, to buy, you know, a larger volume. So yeah, we, we really leveraged what was put in the lightning and then we brought it, brought it to us. We had a plant already planned for it. Um, so when, again, as we were kind of targeting what we could do at the end of 21, we really were targeting, you know, what can we do with this product for the next two years? That was one that we really went after. And it was a, a pretty big feat because, uh, you know, it had some package challenges for us. It, it met everything we wanted from a performance and, in cost position, but it did have some package challenges that we worked through and, you know, the launch went extremely well when we launched it in January. Donna, I, I love some of these improvements that you made. It sounds um, really great. And, and so do current Mustang Mach-E owners. And I don't know if, you, if you're watching the, uh, the comments at all, but the majority of the comments are people saying, hey, will the existing owners be able to share in any of these improvements? Will anything come over OTAs, like maybe, you know, the um, removal of the, the five second power limiter. And uh, is there anything like that for existing? Yeah. I mean, we're always, yeah. Our, our focus was really getting 24 out and getting it out um, with quality. Right. So like I said, we've embraced this, this kind of always on. So we're always looking into what we can do. Um, you know, OTA has, you know, we have almost 80, 80% of our modules are OTA capable. So we, we leverage that. So the team is looking at it to see what can we do out back to the customer. So um, we're, we're going to try, but uh, we're investigating it still. Okay. So I'm just uh, going back to these motors again. So uh, it's fair to say, I think that they have a uh, better efficiency than the previous ones. Uh, yeah, those, yeah. Better so efficiency, um, you know, different final drive ratio, lighter, um, so yeah, so there, there, there were a lot in that motor that, um, improved for us. So that they're adding like 20 miles to the select and premium trims and 10 miles to the GT. Can you tell us about how efficient maybe they are now? And if there's room for much improvement, obviously we can't get a hundred percent efficient motor, right? But yeah, I, I don't have the exact data on the efficiency comparison. Um, but that is something that we can provide. Okay. Um, so, uh, you say the, the performance upgrade, I guess that's coming to the GT, uh, combines, uh, uh, in your words, innovative powertrain thermal modeling and control algorithms. Can you, can you talk about how the thermal controls have been improved? Yeah, I, again, um, uh, it, it was, you know, calibration, um, 
that allowed us, we also had hard, some hardware changes um, that we took as well in some of the, the powertrain um, components that allows us to expand uh, maybe some temperature um, areas of like how areas of temperature that we can maybe go a little bit higher in. Right. Okay. Um, so again, more so in the power trade controls and how much we can push it. Um, but really wanted us to, to be able to kind of give us that next step up from, uh, you know, not just improving. I mean, the car was really, really fast in current model, right. From a zero to 60 time, but really right. trying to improve that, that quarter mile is really where we heard that the customers wanted to improve. Right. Um, and, and that was the target. Um, but th this GT, I, I, I think I, I saw you've talked about it. You know, we also, as we were looking to develop the product even more, was to simplify it. Um, and okay. when we launched, we launched with, with two levels of GTs. And we were like, let's, let's get the best, you know, best possible one in one configuration out to the customers um, and really leverage kind of that GT essence. Um, so we, we did take, you know, and, and we wanted to just get the best ride out there and get just more of that performance feel in, in just all GTs. So you can see some of the, the accents different, um, the performance seat is standard, the Magna ride is standard. Um, so when you check that box for GT, you get all of that now going forward and then, you can, the decision that you make is, is a wheel, uh, you know, is a tire, um, and then this performance upgrade. But I, I think anybody that's considering GTs, uh, you're going to check the box on this upgrade because you're going to want, you want to be all in on it. Right. Yeah. Richard, Richard in their comments here says one, one GT is enough, I guess. I don't know. So, so I guess that, that does help with the cross. Like I noticed that you really uh, streamlined the lineup, like the, the different trim levels and that really helps with cost, I guess, because the cost has come down quite a bit, like for over the last uh, yes. little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you can even see with everything that we've done from 23 to 24, right. Those prices are, are very comparable, right. Um, again, very aggressive market. Um, the customers want a certain price level and that's what we looked at. Like, where could we take complexity out? Where could we get some savings? Where does it make sense for us to do that? And that's that's how we approach the GT for 24. Um, it, it was just trying to find as many efficiencies as we could, right, to, to get uh, the most efficient vehicle out there. Right. Tom, you have some more questions? Sure. I, I don't want, I don't know if Kyle and Martin have anything, right, but yeah. I'll, 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 I'll um, All right, grab anyone, one quick. Anyone. The... Um, how about, uh, is there going to be any improvements on the information you get on the driver's display or the center screen as far as like charging information? Um, you know, I know I saw some 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 uh, comments about that. And that's something I, I own a Lightning. I'd like to have better information on the Lightning too. But um, is that anything planned? Yeah, uh, that, that is. We're working on it. Um, and, and we work on it. We, you know, we have a, a group. Um, we always talk that we work on things in our, our hub. We actually work on just EV in general with our cross-functional teams with Lightning and mach -E. What are the customers telling us that, you know, that what we want? What do we do? What do we need to do more consistently across both of those vehicles and then leverage it across any of the other vehicles? So um, that is an area that we are working on right now. Uh, any suggestions that you may have, just, you know, shoot them over <laughs> to me. I'd love to hear them because uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we do have and and the plan will be once we have it in the vehicle coming out of the plant, we will OTA it. Okay. I, I'll take you up on that. Get ready for a long email. That's um, fine. And Love really it. quick, going back to the motors that these are in-house motors. I, I notice a lot of OEMs seem to be doing that. Their, their first EV, they come out and they're sourcing motors and then they're designing motors in-house and using them for future iterations. Is that something that you see you following suit with the Mustang line? Is it, you know, is it, is it better to, you know, that vertical integration, having your own motor that you designed in-house and using as opposed to sourcing one from a third yeah, party? I, Could we see more of that with Ford? I think you're going to see more of that, that we do it in-house, right? Um, you know, we have the design, we'll leverage our designs going forward um, and really build on them. But that, that, that's something that we want to do as a, as a critical commodity at Ford in our EVs. 
and and so not to beat you up, but circling back to the question I asked you earlier about previous model years getting any kind of update, it sounds like none. That's not if it does happen, it's not going to happen soon. Yeah, um, I don't know that you can say it won't happen soon. It just I think we have to make sure that when we expand those levels, right? Um, we want to make sure that you know twenty four was very well tested. Right. And the and the hardware that's on there. So we just want to make sure that if we go back to a different set of hardware with that kind of software, we want to make sure that we test it. Right. And are confident in sending it back. So um, that those are just steps that we have to do. Um, and our focus had been on 24. And now we we're, we're going to focus on, you know, what can we what can we do? To the units in the field because it's important to us right we we want to you know we want to keep those vehicles fresh that that has been a goal of ours as well um since we've launched um but yeah i can't give you a timeline but we are we are investigating it okay thanks because we have a lot of mach -E owners <laughs> following us here so they, they've been waiting for this interview <laughs> yeah Anyone hey, else want to grab a question? Donna, if, if I may, I'm sure Kyle's a previous owner of a Mackie. I'm sure he's got some questions. Very quickly, I've got two questions for you. As enthusiasts of the, the EV industry, you're chief engineer of the, the Mackie project, right? Is that hardware and software as well? Yes, it's everything. So, right. So when you see people like us, idiots on YouTube and the internet saying, oh, wouldn't it be cool to have the charging speed on the display? Or, you know, like uh, Rivian just had the cumulative price of when they're using superchargers oh that'd yeah. be cool and surely that's a, a five minute job like when you when you see that and you see idiots like us saying well just add it what's the process that happens behind the scenes for a huge organization yeah. with thousands of people working in it to then be like well that's a cool idea how does it go from that to when we see it in the car like it must be a, a huge process so we so we have um our team you know comprised of like our vehicle team and our vehicle engineering team so we we are on social media and different forums every day and we actually work with kind of our our product feature and pro, our feature owners and product owners that are very you know specific to let's say charge time right or anything charging so you know we'll kick around kind of from a maki what would we like and then but we do have this forum where we bring all these groups in because it might have to you know it might have to be the PCM that has to give the information to, you know, um, you know, the BCM or you have to get it from the BCM. You have to get it from multiple modules just to display it on what we think is so simple to just display it on the sync screen or the, your center screen. So um, we meet weekly with that cross functional team um, and in just, you know, how would it work? We take in benchmarking, you know, what do we like? You know, what could be better? And uh, so it is just a very um, collaborative and it is across multiple organizations that we get in. But we, you know, we saw it. We, we actually formed this group around like distance to empty calculations and just what we were displaying and a lot of competitor, you know, our our competitors. Everybody does it a little bit differently. And we heard from our customers early on. Um, about what we were displaying. So we formed this group to just focus on that. And, you know, and we made some changes in, in um, through OTA and we sent those out um, to the customers as well. And we just thought this works so well that we're like, okay, we're going to do it on everything EV, right? And, and that was, that's an area that you mentioned that we are spending time on and we will have something out. Our, our goal is to have something out end of this year. And then we would, um definitely OTA that one back. It's so good to hear that you, you know, you do look for the community for ideas and you you want to bring, you know, owners into that that process as well. Um just as lastly from me, give us an insight into what it's like to be the chief engineer on a on a project like this and how your day-to-day -day works because I can imagine there's some pressing stuff that has to be done as you say in these weekly, these sort of week-to-week -week rushes yeah. that you might have to get a fix out for something, but also like, what does your calendar have on it? Obviously, 25, 26, 27, like how? And then you have to kind of work on these long term things as well and change your brain into this long term thinking. What's that like for you as, a, as an engineer? Yeah, I, I'm just going to tell you, you love every minute of it. When you when you work in this field, this is what you want to do. Um, so when you get to this level, you're loving it because you have launched so many different um, vehicles and you're owning it. Um, and the day is crazy. 
you know, when I first took over, um, it was very much listening to customers. What are they telling us? You know, you're always are going to have, hey, what's happening in the field and managing, you know, changes to to take into account what's happening in the field. But really listening to the customer was the, really the first six months that I was on the job and then saying, OK, what are we going to do? And then creating a plan of, OK, what are we going to put, you know, do? And we've we've actually taken a lot of actions like every six months, you know, we, we launched a, a new standard range battery last year. Um, right. And now we're doing this upgrade. So, and it can, we're also flexible, right? So as something new comes in, we, I try to figure out how to weave that into our current plan where, you know, we call it always on because we are always listening to the customer. We're always watching the data. We're always watching this vehicle, learning and, and trying to, you know, get the most out of it and make it better for our customers. So it's, it is a crazy day. It's long days, but we wouldn't be in this field if you didn't love what you did every single day. And, and it makes it easy. Um, the chaos is there, but it makes it easy when you love what you do. Right. Thank you. Do you have anything, Kyle? Yeah, Donna, I can't thank you enough for joining on our show. It's great to see you again. Thanks, We've Kyle. done stuff on track together. It's been so fun over the years. And, uh, you know, I think my colleagues have berated you enough about the details of the Maki -E and power limitations. And you know what we want out of this car. And I think it comes back to, for me, every time I drive a Mustang Mach-E uh, is that, you know, it represents a new era of Mustang at a high level. And we want that same sort of young in heart spirit, this incredible performance that the Mustang undoubtedly needs and sort of this rowdy character. And that is what I see embodied in the new rally trim. And I don't think <laughs> we've you. touched on that no. yet, but this is like, you know, build a car for Kyle Connor and it kind of looks like the Mach-E rally. So, my question's more or less on, uh, we can talk about the 24 model updates all day long. Yeah, I want charging on the screen displayed and blah, blah, blah. But is the rally going to be hardcore fun on the dirt? Like, are we able going to, are we going to be able to slide it around Kyle. and push it? And what's oh that going to be like? Will. Kyle, you're going to absolutely love it. Um, I, I could go on and on about the rally. So rally, very short turnaround product, right? Um, really felt like this was a space that we didn't really have any EVs in. Um, you know, we it's higher than a, the higher ride height than the the GT um, gives it the the rally inspired look. We do have under um, underbody shielding that we upgraded. Um, we actually created a rally course out at our proving grounds for this um nice. and really working with um in employees ford employees that rally cross vehicles um and and they ran this vehicle around that track that they created you know over 500 miles so you know just really made sure that it, it's capable it is so much fun you are going to enjoy driving this vehicle um, on dirt, on grass, you know, that, that's what it was made for. That's what we wanted to be capable of. Um, it has been such a fun project to work on. And, and honestly, it, it, it developed, you know, we, we say we developed it by the time we said, okay, here's what we can do it was about 16 months, you know, but from the first, Hey, kick it around. What, what do you think, you know, less than two years to do something like this. And it, they're coming off the line down at our assembly plant. Um, you know, we went to job one last week. So okay. we are so totally excited for this one. And and what it doesn't, it does great, Kyle, off-road, you know, but on-road, this thing can go, it just gives you the confidence that it can go through any kind of weather conditions or any conditions. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. Yeah, can't wait. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I just, it's, it's got to be rowdy. Sounds like it's going to be fun. And uh, yeah, it I is. guess we're we're driving it in a few weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. Awesome. So you're so you're building them now. So when do like first deliveries happen? Pretty soon then? So um, they'll be able to ship out. Our target would probably be within the end of the month, beginning of May. Um, you know, ordering online for, for 24 and rally just, you know, just went live as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, we're excited that we're going to start seeing more on the roads probably within, I would say, 30 to 60 days. Nice. Nice. 
And it's and the, the other the other trims, the twenty twenty four trims, are those available now or it's the uh, same timeline? Yeah. Okay. Everything everything. Um so we pre pretty much ordering for the GT started in, in April as well. Um so we're we're fully up and running with every trim level. All right. So I guess that's probably everything we're up over your time by a couple of minutes, but um I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. Was there anything you wanted to let our audience know before we, before we let you go? No, just just considered EVs. We're we're making, uh, you know, at, we're trying to create different space for them, right? To get more people in them, and just you know, tell your friends, get more people in EVs because uh, they're really something to drive. They are fun. I, I know your your listeners will know that, but just getting more people in these vehicles uh, is what we need. What right, you really thanks. need is to get the dealers selling them better, Donna, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> of course, we know they're great vehicles to drive and everybody likes driving them. But if if you show up to a dealer and the dealer says, nah, go for the gasser, that's that's a big hurdle. We're but that, as you said, that's a whole nother topic. Thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. All right. That was that was great. Um, so. I've only got a few few miles of seat time in the in the like 2021 Machi, I think. So I'm I'm pretty excited about getting the go in the 24. Um, so speaking of excitement, Kyle, you got to drive recently. Uh, what is probably the most exciting, relatively relatively attainable electric performance car a couple of weeks ago at Laguna Seca, the Hyundai Ionic 5N. Uh, now that embargo has dropped, and you're you've put out the I think you've put out the definitive uh, video for this car. It's like a, or I should say, a crossover SUV, which is kind of weird to think we have like cars like this size and shape, like as, as, as like a, with sports car capabilities. So the, the video is full of all the nerdy details. It's like over in an hour and 20 minutes, uh, and it has chapters, chapter, so people can go straight to the parts they're most interested in. But just to start top line, what can buyers kind of expect from this car? Is it hard hardcore enough for the track, or too hardcore to daily drive? Well, and and actually, I just want to back up for a second because sure. I don't think we are really appreciating how cool it is that Donna came on our show. I oh, mean, very awesome. rarely it is often where we have the opportunities to talk to CEOs or top level executives at companies. And you guys know there's almost nothing I hate more than doing that. But what we can <laughs> talk to actually the engineers of the products, the ones that are into the details every single day and feeling all of the emotion of we ha every time we make a change, the cost budget goes this way. And what is mm. the actual benefit for a consumer? And how do you tool up a production line? And Donna's right at the core of that. There are very few people in the world that actually understand the car business as much as someone in Donna's position. So it's really, I'm just thrilled that she was able to come and a huge thanks to Ford uh, I, honestly, I totally did not know this was happening. I know Dominic, you <laughs> called me last night that, that Donna was coming on the show. I was like, hell yeah. And then like, I just thought about something else and I logged in and I'm like, Donna's here. This is awesome. So <laughs> well, this is, Tom, well, th look, this is Tom's doing. I think we spoke on Tuesday or Wednesday night and Tom was like, I'll, you know, why not, why don't we ask? Because, you know, we had uh, other, you know, Tom's had Jim Farley on and Darren Palmer comes on here. Um, and you know, you can, if you don't ask, you don't get. And so I think it was only a couple of days ago that Tom put the request in they're like yeah we'll come on and talk about that with your audience and that's so cool that they like how many car companies do that it's so cool they care about what their their buyers their customers think yeah i knew yeah, she'd be a rock star of a, of a uh you know guest so and and i specifically didn't tell kyle because we know he doesn't <laughs> like interviews so uh, and and even though i know this is an interview he would like i just communicated with martin and i was like look i think i'm going to get donna on and he's like, great, go for it. And then I told Dominic, oh, we've got Donna. We, we, I kept Kyle out of the loop. He, he didn't, he was on a need to know basis. So <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I mean, when, whenever we get a chance to interview engineers, this is like the best. That's why I do my job so I can learn more about the car industry and, and Martin's questions on the, the business and the day to day of this. That's all I'm fascinated with. So that was really, really great. Anyway, you, you say um, you don't like interviews, but also on a, a rare edition of the Outspec podcast uh, where you took the, the lead on this one, um, you also spoke to uh, the VP or SVP of, uh, of software at, uh, at Rivian. Um, and yeah. That was a great interview. So recommend, because obviously, you know, Tom, you did that as well for State of Charge, but uh, I, I dialed into the podcast expecting to see Francie and I was like, 
like, oh, I see. So Kyle's wheeled himself out for this interview. So he does do some stuff that uh, he's fascinated <laughs> because he is, yeah. I mean, like Wasim is right at the heart of, of software development for Rivian. He's right at the very top of that. So um, yeah. that, was, that was a great podcast. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think from from my perspective, it's like if someone's knowledgeable and totally understands what's happening and gets the picture, I'm all in. But there's just too many people in the auto industry that are just figureheads and just not into the nitty gritty stuff that I care about. And well, you know, of course, Wasim and Donna and folks on their level totally get everything down to the smallest detail up to the full picture. So that was awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, Ionic 5N, oh man, do we, we should really just blow through this car because there's only a few things everyone needs to know about it, which is absolutely spicy, really fun car. It's about $10,000 less than I thought they were going to charge for it for something this hardcore. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a little pocket rocket. It's not small, but it feels small and it's just freaking awesome. I loved your video. It was great. I and mean, we're looking at it here on the screen if, for those who aren't watching us on YouTube at the moment. Um, yeah, it, it's so basically it's so the Hyundai Motor Group includes Kia and they've already put out their, their spicy version of the EV6, which also sits on this EGMP platform. Uh, this this is a little bit different, though. You know, I think you, you mentioned in your video that, you know, the GT, the uh, Kia EV6 GT, you know, it was just like the G, basic GT, but spiced up a little bit or the basic EV6 spice up. This is a, almost like a complete rebuilding, right? It feels like. Yeah, the way I've been describing this is this is the only time you get Porsche GT level when they do a GT3 or a GT4. You get that level of, of, of obsession going all the way down to the body in white, adding welding points, adding structural adhesive, changing every single bit of the suspension. The, all the kinematics are different. All the compliance settings are different. Everything is completely different on this car from the standard car. And that is like a lot more value than $8,500 in price extra to get this over a top spec Ionic 5. That's like, you know, we're, we're talking... Tons of effort, a complete recalibration and re-engineering of drive systems, battery systems, has a different battery. Um, it's like just dialed up to not even 11, but dialed up to 12. And we we just haven't seen, I mean, even if we if we just go back to the, the Ford conversation really quick, Mustang Mach-E and EV6 GT and Genesis GV60 and this class of car, where this car sits in, they've always been the dialed up versions of the standard car. But this is like build a cup car and then dial it down for the street. We've just never seen anything like this in this wow. price category. It's like this and Tycon Turbo GT. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this is at an affordable price. So what was it? 66 one or something like that? Yeah. It's great. I mean, 66 grand. This is all, this has got to be one of the most, the best ways to spend $66,000 on a car. <laughs> it's got to be a halo car for them. They, they're definitely losing money on this. But, you know, it's companies do that, you know, to show showcase their technology. You know, Tom, I, I could I totally agree. In Europe, the car's a lot more expensive. Uh, so it's it's a lot more expensive in other markets than the U.S. So I'm not sure what they found with our market that works. I will say there's not as much demand from the consumer base, just from the outside looking in, as I thought there would have been. I mean, I knew this is going to be a niche product and and the crossover of electric and performance is still pretty minor. I think there's a crossover of electric and people who want perceived performance, which would be straight line acceleration, Model S plaid stuff. Um, but this is a, a total vehicle package of performance, braking system, suspension system, seats, steering, everything. And I'm not sure many EV drivers can appreciate the work that went into this car. Uh, and I'm already seeing them on lots just in inventory. So it's not like there's a backlog. Like you can just go and get one. Now, now you can. Yeah, oh yeah, they've been out for they they've actually been on the roads longer than the event. I could have gotten a personally owned car and made the video before this. Uh, oh. <laughs> I was able to talk about need, this, but yeah. yeah. I need to go down my local dealer then and see if they got anything <laughs> sitting there. Just to you know check it out in person. Yeah, I've been I'm in all the Hyundai Ionic 5 like Facebook groups and buying and selling ones and the dealers post their inventory right. and there was an orange one that was just posted at sticker in Reno, I think, like they're, they're just going at MSRP and they're readily available and there's no limit. It's not like a limited edition car, which I think is kind of cool. Nice, nice, nice. So this, 
I mean, it's got a, looks like it has a whole lot going on. How how different is the interior of this car from the regular car? It looks like you got performance seats as well as. Yeah, so I it's hard. So what, what I don't fully understand and what Hyundai's not being fully transparent about, which is frustrating, is what are we seeing here? Is it the refresh, the facelift 2025 Ionic 5, which I believe is already out in South Korea? And the, that already has the new infotainment, some new layout, some other stuff, and the new battery pack, which and is the 80... Bigger, the bigger pack, yep. Yeah, it's 84 kilowatt hours up from 77. And... Uh, and I'm not, I don't think that's quite usable, but usable is pretty close. And, you know, it's like, okay, did they put a bigger battery in just for the 5N, which is kind of how it was branded to the American journalists? Or is this just the facelift car that comes with the bigger battery, which is more what I think it is? So it's hard to say exactly what 100% is changed between this and a 2025 Ionic 5, because in the US, we only have 24s. Right. Well, the the stance would be different, right? I mean, for the for the the end, we'll have the the wider wider uh, you know wheel stance, right? That's uh, nope. So the, the the that's minor, but it's that's mostly okay. on the fenders. That's just tacked on. So okay. all of the the dimensions being larger, or just because they slapped on arrow. Okay, there's no there's while well, they have bigger wheels, I guess, on it. Then that's it. There's no different yeah. differences changes to the suspension. The, the well, the suspension is completely different. The, the The whole geometry is different as well. But the but the actual track width is right, very right. comparable. Track width was was the word I was looking for there. Sorry, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, so real, just real quick, I don't we we got all kinds of stuff to talk about, but uh, steering feel. I just curious what your opinion of that. Uh, so I, I feel like the Taycan is probably like the benchmark for electric sports car for for steering feel. How does that com how does this compare? Uh, different strategies. Taycan is a very stable car, and it is a ah uh, well, you know this is incredible steering. I'll just start with that. The the okay. the feel what what's going on is really great. A lot of it is synthetic, as with any electric steering system. Uh, and I actually did a whole segment of this video with their chassis engineer talking about how they upsized the output of the motor. So it's a stronger motor to handle the higher lateral loads of higher grip and track use and cup car use. And also how they're simulating certain frequencies that come into the rack versus leaving some unwanted ones out. They also, they've quickened the steering ratio a little bit. And, um, you know, there's no rear steer. I think part of the magic of Taycan and the ones that you've driven are sort of this four wheel steering approach. This total vehicle is moving in the way that you want it to. This is still just front steer. And so it's not as magical, but you do get a ton of feedback. You can place the car perfectly and the car is extremely playful. Like I would say almost too playful to be fast. And I think that was the goal. Like you're just always in slip angle if you want to be. I mean, you can drive it in a way where you're not drifting and and set up some settings. But if you watch like my hot laps, I'm always just got opposite lock on coming out of corners. And I'm just trying to hold it right on the limit because um, I didn't know. They, they kind of told me don't drift it. And I was like, what? 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 I just want to go <laughs> sideways everywhere. So I was just doing mini skids everywhere. But they did, you know, they, they kind of figured out what was up and they let me go full send, which was cool. Um, yeah, so that was that was fun. Right. Um, Tom, do you have any f 5N questions? No, no. Kyle's the one driving it. He knows, you know, he can explain it better than I do. I, his video was great. So uh, he, he pretty much did a good job. So speaking of, you mentioned, uh, I don't know if synthetic was a word, but so it, it makes all kinds of like, synthetic sounds and, and, you know, it, it mimics the automatic transmission or manual transmission with the paddles. Uh, first of all, I just want to know, was it loud inside the car? It seems loud inside the car. Is it loud outside the car as well? Yeah, I just saw a comment, and I agree. I've listened and, and read these things. Uh, Matt Farah and, and Kamisa felt that the steering was too numb. But keep in mind, they're comparing a lot of these cars to the combustion world of enthusiast combustion cars, which I would agree. This is a 5,000-pound behemoth of an SUV that you're hauling around, and it is right. – not comparable but when you look at other vehicles that this is directly going against which kind of in my opinion just limits it to electric the steering's great i felt uh but uh, but i agree mate. i mean like uh i just had a cayman on on test that has like almost picture perfect steering i pick up a lotus amira tomorrow that's going to be exciting so yeah it's not that at all but so right. but in the category of five thousand pound electric suvs pretty damn good 
uh, pretty damn good. So yes, uh, you had a question, Dominic, on something else. Um, I was just going to uh, see. Was it, oh the sounds were the sounds loud mm. outside the car? Yes. Okay. Because I know you get like inside, you can feel it. So I was just wondering if that transmits to the world around you. Like can they hear this you is, bipping the the throttle behind. Yeah. You? This is the part I kind of struggle with because right. I don't want to say I'm a purist because I embrace new technology. Sure. But I do enjoy the powertrain that I'm driving. I'm an I'm a combustion enthusiast all day long, and I'm an electric enthusiast all day long, and I want to enjoy the powertrain that I have chosen to drive on that day. And thankfully, this car lets you do that. You can turn all this off. And and Dominic, you and I talked about it last night on the phone too. It's like the the sounds, the simulated automatic transmission with manual paddle shifters as an option as well. Um, this may convince some people to get into EVs because this sound might be what they're missing. It's True. not a real sound. You know it's synthetic. The right. way that it's been integrated in terms of feeling the torque curve of a turbocharged four-cylinder engine and having you know rev match downshifts when you pull the paddle and having a physical red line for each gear it's all done really well mm. like the the okay. optimization is incredible it's not convincing but it's it's like I, I sometimes play like a set of corsa or gran turismo or one of these games and i'm still enjoying myself not as much as i if i was in the real world driving the real car on the real track but if i'm not able to i'm still having fun with video games it's a bit like that and i feel as an ev enthusiast someone who loves to go to track days with electric cars you know, just for my personal preference, this is like optimizing something that shouldn't have been in there in the first place. So it's really nicely done, but but it shouldn't be there. Um, right. However, there's just an off button. So if you don't like it, just turn it off. And if you love it, use it. I don't care. It makes right. you slower. That's the part I don't get. People are like, oh, this is great. But I'm like, I just I'm trying to get a lap time in. Uh, I just want, you know, full full send all the time here. And because it's simulating a, a the deficiencies of a combustion engine in the fact that, you know, at 3000 RPM, it doesn't make as much power as 5000 RPM and it trails off up at, you know, 7000 and you're, you're working a simulated gearbox when I'm just like power, give me the boost <laughs> button. I don't get it. <laughs> right. yeah, it has a boost button. I, you were kind of not complaining, but you had to deal with the boost button. So it, it was it called Ngrin boost NGP. Yeah. Terrible name. Terrible. Name. Yeah. But so that's basically a little overboost for like a few seconds at a time. Every every it's forty horsepower. Forty okay adds forty four for how long? Ten seconds, and then you have to ten. wait ten seconds. Okay, so it's ten on, ten off. Right, and so you yeah. I'm like, I, I hope one day I can I can understand why a boost button is functional to the end user. Right. Mm. Well, I, was, I mean, I was thinking that it would just help you plan where you want to use your extra energy on the track, you know. Right, but I, just... I'm planning by going wide open throttle. I'm saying yes. go as fast as you can now. My foot's yes. to the floor. Use all of the energy. That I want to go. Where, yeah, that bit where your foot's <laughs> all the way down, that that's it. Give me yes. everything now. So, I mean, yeah, you can have like an overdrive or kick down button, but just give it all now. So, but the, the yeah. Tycon, you know, the Tycon made a big deal about its its new buttons. And and I still argued with the Porsche engineers about Good. why Tycon has pushed the pass and attack mode because I don't get it. And no Good. one could give me a convincing argument. They're like, but we use it in racing. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I'm on a yeah. track day trying just, to have fun. Yeah, just give <laughs> it like, all give to me, me now. Power. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. All right. Uh, all right. Oh, so, Kyle, really way, quick last question on this. Sounds like you would take one of these over a Macan EV if somebody said you needed to. You have okay. one vehicle to drive for the next year, and which one? No. Which, we're we're going to give it to you. Which one? Which one will you take? I think I'm I'm still under embargo for Macan EV, so I can't. I think that, that, that. has nothing to do with talking about Macan uh, uh, about the driving impressions. Which one would you rather own? Oh, a Macan. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All day long. Not even okay. a question. But uh, a and I thought you were going to say the other way, but okay, good. I mean, no, at, I, at, the end, at the end of the day, Porsche is Porsche, and you know it's going to be good, what, right? At the end of the day, I like a vehicle that I can customize to what I want in it. And uh, the Ionic 5 satisfies, because I can talk about this car, the mm -hmm. rowdy character that I love mm -hmm. in a vehicle. But but then I don't get a glass roof. I don't get a banging sound system. I get, True. you know, it, I, I don't know. It just comes down to, like, there's a lot of things Porsche does that makes a car feel special. Right. And the Ionic 5 is still a Hyundai that's really fast. Yeah. And I am a 
uh, I would totally buy one. And I'm considering buying it a 5N, by the way. I'm considering selling my Plaid and buying a 5N. Wow. Uh, and I'm not considering buying a Macan. That's not a car that I need. I, I We have an e-tron. I don't need that car. But if I had to have one and I park that in the garage every day, mm. to, uh, Macan. Mm. Very interesting. interesting. We do fair. we do we do a midweek show for anyone watching this, and I know there's people watching this that don't watch our midweek shows because these ones do better on Fridays. Uh, called Battery Bargains, and uh, and we talk about the Ionic Five a lot. Not the end version, but this. So check it out in your feed. Subscribe to the channel as well, and check out if you're interested in in buying EVs and prices. Uh, some amazing deals: seven and a half thousand dollars off uh, a Hyundai. A Hyundai provided discount, uh, but you know we're talking about deals lately with the Ionic Five, rear wheel drive, admittedly, uh, but two two nine a month to lease that with about three and a half grand down over two years. I'm not a huge fan of leasing, but what an incredible vehicle to get into the Ionic Five for the. What, what do you want, this or a Tucson for more money? Like get the Ionic Five. So uh, so check out that show as well, and there are some good deals on the Ionic Five. Emma is asking Kyle. Could you time an Ionic N loan when we're over for Pike's Peak? <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. You know, we're going to be doing the, you know, we're going to do a spicy SUV comparison. So I think it'll be like Mach E Rally or GT versus Model Y Performance versus 5N, EV6 GT, and all that stuff. And a portion of that will be lap time. Right. Yeah, this this so, sounds like Emma's pretty confident that, you know, what she's bringing will, uh, <laughs> will, uh, compete well with the, uh, 5N. Okay, if that's the case, that would be crazy because be good, this it? car is just another dialed up level <laughs> in my impression. But, so you know, is, that's why we got to do the comparisons. Well, Hyundai it, are taking four cars to Pikes Peak, aren't they? Right. And two of them are the road cars minus the rear seats, got roll cage, fire suppression, stuff like that. I'm not sure they've talked about the other two cars they're uh -huh. bringing. I don't know they, if I should break the news. Maybe they have <laughs> talked about it to you, <laughs> they but have, not to me. They have. Yeah, they have. And okay. it's going to be cool. Uh, I don't know if it's under embargo or not, so I'll wait till the next show to say anything. But okay, basically, okay, okay. they're they're all in on Pike's Peak. Right. That should be okay. good. That It should be uh, brutal by the sounds of it. Good. Good. I look forward to hearing about that. So does, do you know if anyone know if Ford has a vehicle in Pike's Peak this year? Yes. Ford always does, or at least for the last couple of years, they have right. something pretty cool coming this year, an iteration. I don't think it's the super van. It okay. was uh, something else that's going to be neat, maybe Maki -E related, Mustang related. Sixty years of Mustang. I don't know if it was a dirt road still on Pikes Peak. The no, rally would paved. be fun though. Yeah, it's paved, yeah. but I'm just saying if it was still like the dirt road, the, the rally, the Maki -E rally, that would be kind of fun, right? Ah, uh, so Emma says it's a lightning demonstrator going up. That's cool. Uh -huh. That's right. And uh, but let's bring a rally. Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. Bring yeah, it. I was looking at the uh, looking at. Pikes Peak this year. I kind of want to go this year. It's been a few years. It's going to yeah, be you should come. I mean, we always park the Sprinter at the top of the hill. And, right. uh, you know, we're cooking out for everyone. We got a bunch of beer. We got Starlink. So we're streaming it live. Oh. And then the cars go by. The yeah, out of spec always... Pikes Peak party happens every year at the top of the hill. Awesome. All right. Um, so uh, let's, let's move on. We got some, well, yeah, we got time. Um, so I don't know. Let's see where are we go. Oh, yeah, so I don't know if this past week topped the week before, Kyle, but you actually just got back from France, where you drove, as you said, the electric uh, version of the Porsche Macan. Unfortunately, the dri the embargo on driving impressions is still up for that, so we'll have to talk about it in the future. But you also got to dr experience the powertrain from the Macan and a whole other vehicle. I believe you have a video coming up about that maybe today. I, I don't know. What can you tell us about this very special? Yeah, it'll be thing? today or tomorrow. I have to see. We okay. have like an ad deal that has to go in our Model X rustic ring video. And so uh, I, someone will tell me which one I can set live today uh, after okay. this show. But I drove a boat and it was an electric boat. It was not my first time ever on an electric boat, but it was on my first time ever on an electric boat that goes more than 20 knots, let's just say. Because I've been on electric ferries and I've been on like electric, uh, you know, um, like uh, those the, Disney the, exploration the, ride the, things. The, 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 also the Taiga uh, jet ski. The jet ski. Oh, yeah, that was cool. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. But this is a <laughs> boat. A you got to have a lot of money to buy this boat because yeah. this is a, a small boat, not meant to like go on adventure. This is just a to as a tender to your super yacht or just to blast around at a resort. And it's $600,000. <laughs> it's a, like a, it's a lot of money or something. 
Yeah, plus or minus 24 feet, I want to say. They had okay. it in meters. I can't remember which one. They have different lengths. Right. Uh, but what I think was really cool about all of this is underneath the the vehicle, underneath the boat, is a identical Macan EV drivetrain. Wow. So it is like, you know, PPE spans Q6 e-tron, A6 Avant, A6 sedan, Macan, and now a boat. So it is a <laughs> boat. Uh, built on PPE, pretty cool. So yep, it uses, cool. it's uh, you know, it's got the the turbo rear motor, the big nine hundred amp big boy <laughs> motor in the back. They had to derate it because they said they were exploding the propeller drives. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, but it's still fast as hell. It's still really cool, and it's not dead silent. It could use a little bit more optimization. Uh, just all in the the rear gearing stuff is like combustion meant for combustion engines, uh. and so. NVH wasn't always a top priority for those, and now it needs to be. So the loudest thing by far is the bow thruster, wow. <laughs> that is, okay. which is a cool experience. And it's got the same, you know, 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, 95 kilowatt hour usable, 270 kilowatt peak DC fast charging with a good curve, just like the standard car. Uh, yes, it's awesome. Is that some nice blue sky? Is that south of France? Yeah, that was. And wow. normally I'm not Mr. I love France, but this was actually uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was actually a nice trip. It was pretty it's good. It's fine. It's it's fine. Yeah. I, I'm on board with that. Uh but uh, yeah, what a terrible time you look like you're having there in the south of France. Looks awful. I feel I feel sorry for you, but thank thank you for taking one for the team this week. <laughs> yeah, don't feel sorry for me. Um uh, we filmed a lot. I think I filmed like five videos on a bunch of different stuff. I also filmed their charging trailer, which was super sick. Yeah. Uh, and a few right. other things. And of course, stuff still under embargo. So it was it was a nerd week and filled with great driving roads. So I'm not complaining at all. So this boat is this being sold by is it a Porsche boat, branded Porsche, or is it a collaboration with another company? Yeah, it's a collaboration with Frauser, which is like a super high-end Austrian boat company. Uh, okay. They can only build a handful of boats a year, but uh, Porsche basically says, "Will you know? You can customize it to match whatever of your car." It's got Porsche switch gear and a Porsche steering wheel. It oh, actually nice. even uses the same Macan key to start the boat. It's just wire. You know, if it's in your pocket, boom, you're good to go. It's just like a car. And the integration I thought was was better than anything I had ever seen before. And uh, you can buy it. They have reservations open. Deliveries start less than one year from now. And okay. most of the ones that have been ordered are in America. Wow. Look at that. Oh, maybe we can go uh, Frauscher boating at some point. What I told them that I wanted to do was my friend is an electric plane pilot in Switzerland. This oh. is an electric boat. And then uh -huh. I was like, I also want a Macan. And we're going to develop a route and see who can get to wherever first and just race all the electric stuff against each other. Maybe like the triathlon, but for electric vehicles. So air. Yeah, that would be cool. Air, land, and water. Yeah, and <laughs> Frauser, the, po the folks who make the boat, they were just like, this is awesome. This is cool. Whatever you want to do with the boat, go take the <laughs> boat. <laughs> all right. Um, so you mentioned... Um, uh, one, one, well, so one last thing about your time in France. So Porsche had this trailer there, I guess, filled with power electronics and, and batteries. Uh, basically, a mobile high power charging station, 2.1 mega hours of uh, megawatt hours of storage. Uh, you published a video about it yesterday that people can check out with all the details. But uh, tell us about this trailer that U.S. charge networks could have to fill in for ground ground stations when they get taken off the line for whatever reason. It just seems like a really amazing. Uh, you know, trailers full of how many, how many chargers are on there? Uh, so there are 10 each. So the story goes, these, these are old, by the way, I've okay. known about these. I've actually been up close with them before, but I was not able to film when I was with them before. It was sort of in an area where I couldn't, couldn't grab a camera. So this is my first opportunity able to make a video with them. And back in 2019 for the launch of the Tycon, Porsche was like, you know, they were on a mission to show electric could be fun. And, you know, that includes in Porsche DNA track days, going on adventures, showing what electric's capable of. And there was very limited infrastructure, especially at places where they wanted to do events and places where they wanted to do prototype testing, etc. So my friend Kevin Geek, who's been on the channel uh, many times, he is responsible. He's basically Mr. Electric within Porsche. He's the head of Tycon and uh, he's awesome. So he was like, Let's get some mobile chargers. So he bought seven, 
like two and a half million euro trailers as one does. And, <laughs> and he just was like, make it full send the most amount of capacity, the most flexibility, the highest charging power output. And essentially what it is, is you have 2.1 megawatt hours um, divided up into 10 sections. So you have 210 kilowatt hours of battery storage per dispenser. It can output 320 kilowatts of power. And within all of these systems, you can have an AC input from the grid that can then just keep recharging the batteries. You can actually have like eight or 10 different AC inputs if you want to go crazy. And the batteries can all balance and share with each other and distribute the power. There's a giant like room of cooling systems. They have three different cooling loops inside the trailer and they're all thermally managed on different loops. And uh, what's what's awesome is you can run it in an island mode where you have no grid power. You can run it when you are hooked up to a grid and it'll just take whatever the grid can give it. And, you know, in Europe, they always have these red three phase plugs. I like we just we have them in our office, too, but they can just plug into that and run this thing all day. So it's pretty cool. John check makes a good point. That's going to be a lot of weight to carry around with those big batteries. 70,000 pounds of trailer. <laughs> You're not towing it with a Macan. <laughs> maybe but yeah, 70,000 no. like in Europe actually their weight their like road weight restrictions are typically higher than ours like they right. you can go heavier in Europe than we can in the US yeah. they make the roads better I think right generally. that's very true <laughs> yeah all right um so okay Any, anything else you want to say about the boat before we move on or no the, the boat's sick uh, trailer sick that right. was fun yeah okay so Tom how you doing over there? Still here. Um, you put out a very special video this week. Uh, you traveled up to uh, Ontario, Canada, and sat down with uh, Gleb, who is the uh, founder and CEO of our sponsor, United Chargers. Uh, so United United Chargers, of course, makes the Grizzly line of chargers, and they're launching a new 80 amp unit. They're calling the Grizzly Ultimate EV Charger. So, what, what can you tell us about this? And uh, yeah. So, you know, if anybody knows uh, United Chargers, and you should if you watch this podcast because they are our sponsor, uh, they make really uh, like uh, robust charging equipment. It's really, it's it's for residential use, but it's also, it's great for public use because it's it's some of the like mo most well-built, robust units that you can get. And um, they're introducing a new uh, higher powered unit. It's an 80 amp charger. Uh, currently, the Grizzly that they offer, they offer a, a classic and a, and a, a smart Grizzly, uh, are 40 amp. And I'd been on Gleb for a while saying, Gleb, you got to bump that up to 48 amps. That's what the market is calling for these days. I, I know, you know, when you first released this 40 amps, uh, a 9.6 kilowatt onboard charger was kind of standard. Now, the industry's moved to a 48 amp as kind of being the standard and higher. And I've been pestering him for a while. And he's like, I know, I know. But you know, for most people, 40 amps is fine. And he's right in that. Even if your EV can accept 48 amps, charging at 40 amps for home charging is more than enough for, I mean, more than 90% of the people that own EVs. But there was a need for a higher power charger. So he he, he developed this uh, 80 amp unit and um, he's really high on getting it uh, in pu for public use too. Um, okay. So the, a good part of the... And that's not a earthquake. That's me banging my table. Uh, a good part of my uh, um, interview, we, we talked about his desire to um, uh, proliferate public uh, charging with with higher powered chargers, um, ones that can you know power share. And this can through well, if it's OCPP compliant, so if the software can do it, the the unit can do it. And um, you know he's he's um, I think he's going to do a lot of focusing on trying to get uh this in the hands of communities and, and municipalities where they install rows and rows of public charging um with smart combined with smart charging software so you know you don't need a 100 amp circuit for every single one um the cars will just intelligently balance the power available and the cars will get as much power as they can but it's a good unit for home and the best thing united chargers is always um prided themselves on offering low cost charging equipment. This is $699. There's no uh, 80 amp units available on the market for 700 bucks, uh, no, especially great. ones that are smart chargers that can be connected to an app and controlled through an app. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's really, I think it's going to help 
uh, people that want to install public charging, like in condo associations, building public buildings that want to install 40, 50 chargers. Uh, you know, this is a, an option that it actually will cost less than some of the 32 amp uh, public chargers that are available for some of the other companies. And he's also going to help with uh, like the uh, ongoing costs, like the ongoing costs are a bear. I, you guys know, I used to own public charging when I owned the restaurant and the parking lot. I was paying like 300 bucks per plug per year as like a management fee. And then, you know, then they take their 5% commission on, on whatever you sell it. it, it if you install 20 or 30, uh, you know, level two chargers, say through charge point, you're paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in maintenance fees and everything. And, and what he was hoping to do is have this unit um, be a very low cost solution for people that want to have public charging that can be, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, have control access. It's not just anybody can just plug in, you know, you have to pay to, to, to charge. So in addition to it being a good choice for somebody's home garage, and again, you don't, you can dial down with the internal dip switch, the power, you don't need this to be on, um, you know, uh, you don't need a, to charge at 80 amps. You could set it to limit it to 40 amps or 48 amps if, if you want. And then in the future, uh, let's say you get a uh, an EV that has dual, uh, you know, 40 amp onboard chargers that can take 80 amps. You could just open it back up, provided you installed it properly with the right circuit and and dial it up. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good unit at a good price and uh, they make very durable chargers. So I went up to their United Chargers facility up in Ontario. They have, I think it's 36,000 square foot new facility that he built that uh, Gleb uh, Nikiforov is the, is the CEO. He gave me a tour. I'm going to have a video of the factory tour coming out next, but I wanted the one-on-one -on -one interview with, with Gleb out first talking about the, the new Ultimate, which went on sale yesterday. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, it looks the same as the regular, uh, uh, Grizzly. They just got UL certification. So it's safety certified and, um, yeah, he's, he's really excited about it. He thinks this is going to be his number one seller moving forward. And uh, it's a small company. He club prides himself on the fact that they've taken no public funds where almost all of his competitors have. And one of the things I like is it's all of his equipment. Well, the equipment sold here in North America is built here. It's built in Canada. And which is interesting that. You talk to a lot of the companies and they say, well, we need to build in Asia because, you know, otherwise we're not competitive. He's he's building products in North America that are high quality products and he's selling it for less than the companies that are saying they have to build. They have to they ha we have to make this in China or Taiwan or we're not competitive. So, you know, um, he works on close margins and, uh, you know, he's doing it and he's manufacturing in Canada. Yeah. I, I, I like, I gotta say, I, I like Gleb and I like the, the, you know, he's got a very scrappy attitude and he just puts out, you know, good value. You know, like he really takes this whole thing seriously. He's, you know, a fly by night, just trying to make some quick cash. He's like trying to make quality units that customers can buy at a, at a good prices. So people. I've never used one before. Really? The Grizzly E? Never, never uh, tried it. We'll have to try oh, to do something get you one. Then. We're going to yeah. be, I yeah. talked to Gleb about giving some away here on the podcast to our followers. So yeah. um, I can announce we are going to give away uh, one of these new 80 amp um, ultimates. Maybe Kyle will win it. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but we are going to give one away to our uh, followers here. So we just haven't decided how we're going to select the winner. And I'll, I'll talk to the guys offline about that, but we're going to be giving one away. So Simon says, bottom line, are you being paid to say this? So here's the thing, Simon, they are our sponsor. Um, right. People that have followed me for years, at least, and, you know, the, the four of us know nobody can pay us to say something that we don't right. believe in. You know, you, I don't I don't care. You can give me a million dollars. I won't say something's really good if uh, if if I think it's junk. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing pretty well for myself and I don't I don't need somebody's money to uh, to lie. So uh, my, my reputation is more worth more, more to me than, uh, you know, so a paycheck in the mail. So, um, yeah, they are our sponsor. I wouldn't come on here and trash them, but if it was, if it wasn't good equipment, I wouldn't say it was good. I just wouldn't say anything. I yeah. would just say, you know, they're our sponsor. So, right. um, that's right. how I feel about that. How many weeks, week in, week out, do we mention, oh, Tom's got a new charger review. And we'll spend 10, 15 minutes talking about that and your scoring competitors. And, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And and yet, so we've talked about it this week. They are our channel sponsor, but no, it's not an advert. No, we're not getting paid to extra yeah. to say uh, to say this. I didn't realize that um, 
that even at that level of of AC charging, there was these kind of public funds around to help out charging companies. Only because I I just saw the news today that Tritium has gone into administration and they've taken a ton of you know ah. U, U.S. government help and yeah. uh, you know and the administration's been really pro forward on right. Let's get let's make you know made in America. And I don't know the exact dollar amount that they were provided, whether it was land or factories or incentives or whatever. Um, but a proud Aussie company from Brisbane, uh, you know, relocating to the US and putting their hands in the air today. I mean, they must have taken a ton of, if not public money, at least, you know, benefits of moving to the US. Um, and they went into administration today. So we await the next part of that story. And hopefully that that, that is a going concern because they've got 13, 14,000 units in the ground that you want to be serviced and, and you know, we all yeah. use those tritium units. And so um, I didn't even realize that sort of that kind of, funding and incentives was around for, uh, at that level of building AC charges, but it's good that he hasn't had to rely on that and that the business is, is I didn't realize that, that, you know, it's it's stable and it's yeah. sort of bootstrapped but Here's properly. what we're going to see from a DC charging perspective, a huge consolidation okay. over the next few years. Do you think so? Absolutely. Interesting. There's, there's Most of... of the stuff is junk. <laughs> yeah. And okay. so we're going to see a lot of the junk companies go in the ground, get all the upfront government funding because they meet in every requirements, not be serviced, not be maintained. And in like five or 10 years from now, we'll have a good picture as to what equipment works pretty well long-term, what's cost-effective, what's reliable. We right. need the Toyota Corolla of DC fast chargers. And right now, I'm not sure anyone has actually cracked that code. Okay. Um, you know, we're, we're involved with all of that. I think we don't know what superchargers cost, what they put on their permits is not what the public would pay for them. So we can't use right. that as an example, but you know, you can get really high quality chargers like Alpitronic, like Alpitronic, even chem power, power mm -hmm. but they're so expensive. I mean, it's not stratospherical, but if, if people are just putting in money to put in, you know, chargers, uh, from, from a government funded Nevi site and they're like, let's take as much money as we can. They're going to put in the minimum viable product, which is going to be the cheapest charger that matches the output requirements. And I've seen it many times. I actually have a, a viewer who invited me to come to a charging commissioning opening here in Colorado. And it was for, I can't remember the brand of charger, but we went there. They would not work on Tesla vehicles. They still, six months later, don't work on Tesla vehicles. And then guess who got the money to put them in? And it's just... This is going to play itself out pretty poorly. I have a whole video coming on Nevi and requirements and how I think this is going to be pretty disastrous into the future. Right. Yeah. I mean, government programs like this, they can be helpful, but also generally there's there's going to be some waste. They're not the most efficient programs, you know, generally. So that's, yeah, that should be interesting to, to hear. Um, yeah. So it's such a fast, we should do a whole separate topic on it because... You can just throw money at stuff and it'll be a waste. And it's, you know, you can say you let the market decide, but the market, we've talked about this recently. Uh, that, you know, if you're a salesperson selling a car, you can make twice as much money selling combustion stuff because somebody comes through the door. What do you want? That car? Okay, go and have that one sold. Done. Right. Bonus. Next. To sell an EV, one or two hours with a customer. Here's the plug. Here's charging. Let me explain. How does it fit into your life? If I'm a salesperson, uh, and I'm not, I'm a terrible salesperson, but if I were, I'd sell combustion cars because it's just easier, which is why Kia are offering a $1,500 bonus through the month of April if you, if you sell uh, to, to the dealers who sell per EV. I think it's $1,500 and then down to $500 for, for some models. But that's a great use of money. Like, okay, so we want to sell EVs. Let's incentivize the salespeople to go and sell right. EVs. But right. then other times you can just throw money at stuff and, and, and it just gets wasted or it's... You know, who knows where it goes? It's just frustrating. Right. Um, okay. Well, let's move on a little bit, Tom. I think you also had you also had a chance this week to sit down with Rivian's B VPS software, and it sounds like maybe Kyle did too. I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> Wasim Bensiad. Well, I don't know if you can correct it's my Wasim. pronunciation. Wasim. Thank you. Oh, well, I don't even know what I said. Wasim. Um, talk about a cool, cool feature coming to Rivian vehicles charger scores so can you tell us what they are and how they're calculated so we yeah we don't know the exact formula of calculation but um the rivian pushed out a new software update to uh 2024.11.01 uh that um 
uh, does uh, fixes some minor bugs and things like that. But the main bite of this uh, software update was they revamped the uh, uh, the charging uh, navigation system to include uh, scores for the charging sites, which was really cool. They're A through F, and um, the customer also has the ability now to filter out scores below a B. So there's a, a, ch a box you can check and you can filter out any of the lower scoring uh, charging sites. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the video there. The two um, top ones have uh, A scores. Uh, you know, there's a Tesla supercharger network and uh, um, uh, uh, Rivian Adventure Network. They have A scores. Um, but you, you, you could also see uh, plenty of them. Uh, we don't have anything up on the screen right now that are much lower scores where Rivian customers had difficulty in the past. And the way that makes this system unique as compared to say like a plug share or, or some of the other um, uh, apps that grade sites is that the data that Rivian captured to get the scoring is hard data from vehicles. It's not customer feedback. Um, there, they, uh, there is going to be a new uh, option to be able to leave customer feedback, but initially that's not going to affect the score. Uh, in the future, Rivian said they might figure out a way to have that uh, impact the score or give a separate score, like this is our data, this is what customers say, which I think would be uh, probably appropriate because there's some things you don't capture with pure data. But I mean, there, the, it, fi it factors in a lot of different things. Like if the customer goes up, plugs in, the vehicle doesn't initiate, and then they have to unplug and then plug in again. It also factors in uh, of the sites that the vehicle was calling for more power than the site delivered. So if your Vivian is is asking for 220 kilowatts when it first plug in at a low state of charge, and the charger is giving you like 160 or 170, most customers will not complain about that. Right. Most customers, most customers won't even know that it's getting less than what it's supposed to get. So they wouldn't that's, that's leave a bad score. You're all right over there. I, I just want to. I just want to say, unless you're driving across the country, like in a racing. Like, no, I, oh, yeah. Well, that's most I, people I don't do what off, we do. Just showing off but, my shirt. Oh yeah, that's what you were doing. I'm like, what's what's? Is I'm taking a shirt off. Um, no, 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 no. So uh, I, uh, uh, but but this data captures that, and it will rate the uh, the the charging station based on. Uh, what, you know, was it an optimal charging stop? Did he, did, was the customer able to plug right in immediately start getting power? Did it deliver all the power that the vehicle was asking? Was the charging session interrupted, you know, and, uh, and, and so, so now customers have that extra tool in the navigation and in their app to see which, which sites are better. And the navigation system, when it routes you to charging stops along a long route will, uh, automatically select the higher scored stations if they're along your route and a convenient stop that they'll route you to an a or a b rather than routing you to a, a d and nice. the interesting thing that i found and i searched uh through some of the uh, rivian adventure network sites some of the rivian adventure network sites don't have a scores so rivian is you know that they're 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 not just favoring all their sites, which I thought maybe I was going to find every Rivian site would say a. Hey, no, there's some that don't, so they are being fair about that and letting the data do the grading. Interesting. Did you did you also sit down with them? Yeah. Oh yeah, we did a full show on it. Okay. Is that on the Auto Spec podcast? Yep. Oh, sweet. Okay. Uh, so, any, anything you want to add to that? Nope, Tom did a great job. Okay. It's needed, and uh, the only request I have is make the data public. Oh, really? Like, um, like how? Yeah. Let's shame, name and shame, baby. Oh, okay. Like, I don't know how. How would you do that? Like, publish them on a. Site? What do you mean? Make a map online, so show okay. the full map of chargers, and then right. everyone can click through and see who's rated against each other. It's like rate your charge, but now we're getting hardcore data built in. Yeah, and, color, uh, color, even just like a traffic cool. light. Like a traffic light system that was absolutely green, yellow, or red. I just want to go to the red ones and be like, right, who are you? What have you done? Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> you'd want to. Because uh, those I, are the people killing the transition. Absolutely. I wonder why it hasn't been done before. Like all great ideas, you think, why hasn't this been done before? But maybe because Rivian are able to do it or they they write their own code and no, software stuff. It is because EV drivers actually make the cars. True. That's true. It's as simple as that. 
That is true. Yeah, and they do. They, they get it. So really impressive. I don't know how many, I don't know, I didn't, I've not seen Brandon in the comments this week, but how many things happen between putting a plug into the, the car and the actual juice flowing. I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, between probably 10 and 30 various things, checks. Yeah, there's like four main stages and, and a then, lot of code. And we have a whole video dissecting every single line of code coming soon. And that so is, we put a yeah. sniffer in between and we're going to go through each communication oh, nice. line. So it says, okay. right, how much power do you want? I want this much power. Can I get you know, Well, and then at first it's like, what language do you want to speak? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to speak you? DIN 70121 or ISO 15118? Yeah. And right. then you got to right. choose. And then right. you go through a bunch of other logs and stuff. And then you have to wait for a payment process, which is sort of an off board. And then you get an authorized and then it comes through and it's complicated, but it's not that complicated. We put someone on the moon in the 60s. We're just trying to charge a damn battery here. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that that's all in their logs and now they're like, well, let's use this information. Uh, and that's this is not this is not a subjective review on a you know, website or an app going, um, you know, oh, my, uh, you know, my Hyundai only took 77 kilowatts when it was a 150 kilowatt charger. This is rubbish. It's like, oh, come on. Uh, you know, and, well, and then the they car don't... knows when the battery's cold. To as an uh, yeah. example State so the car charge. can be like yeah. here's the, the the problem with doing it from the charger side or the car side typically is you don't know what the maximum limits are of yep. the other device yes and if you have historical data of what this site is able to produce previously and you also have ocpp telling it the maximum kilowatt output or amperage output that it can do and the vehicle knows what it's requesting even if you're only getting 40 kilowatts on a 300 kilowatt charger, let's just say, but it's minus 20 degrees outside, the vehicle will know this is still an A. I'm getting everything I need. Oh. <coughs> so I, excuse me, I think the Tycon or even the new McCann software, you might have used it already, gets halfway there that when you navigate to a charger, it tells you the, is it the Porsche or the VW stuff I'm thinking of, that tells no, you the, Porsche. the theoretical maximum. So when you navigate uh, to a fast charger and it'll say, hey, you should be at battery temperature. It tells you, it's always told you the temperature. Um, but the new, the new Tycon software says, well, this is what the car can take. And if you don't get it, don't blame us. So, so actually Volkswagen a lot of the says Germans that too. Oh, yeah. and Mercedes, Mercedes, Volkswagen, I don't think BMW does this, mm. but what what is another good metric with charging that Porsche and BMW do, but no one else really, is they they show you on a graph. Here's the the from zero to maximum what the car can take, and then it will give you gray dotted lines that say here's where the charger limits, and you mm -hmm. go up to the the maximum the charger will give you. So it will show you when it's the car and the charger says it can do more, or when the charger is the limit. And that's a really mind that puts you at peace when charging because you can know who's limiting. Yeah, the Kempower chargers that I used recently on the Polestar that were on the Osprey network over here. It might it might not be network dependent. It might just be the Kempower stuff. Tells you if the car can't take what the charger can give. Um, I forget the wording that the screen used, but it was like charging limited by vehicle and i'm like okay it's interesting the hummer says that also i think we're losing you okay dom we're losing oh, dominic we're losing we're, all, we're all here <laughs> uh, okay so his uh, see you dominic <laughs> so his internet's gone. it's nice to know you what was on his uh, what was on his running order the rivian and then he was going to talk about dude loop are you still there dom i'm here uh, Tom's there. <laughs> Tom's gone. Uh, he was going to talk about Dude Loop and uh, and the latest FSD download that he's got um, next on the running order. But it's running over curbs. Oh yeah, I keep seeing that. Yeah, on social media that happened like, to Pete yeah. too. You know Pete oh, really? Yeah. yeah, Pete was trying out the new FSD and uh, and and he, it was on a, a a part where he always took it previously before the new software update, and it always negotiated it just fine. And now it curved the car. Yeah, my so. friend ran over a curb. I know someone else who got dinged wheel like all the way around. Just brutal. So anyway, what else should uh, we talk about? Uh, right. So cars. The other thing that was out this week was the Maserati Grand Cabrio Folgore. Uh, they've taken what was the electric car, taken the roof off, stiffened it. And um, uh, this is it going to be 200 grand so it's not for obviously the you know mere mortals uh, but it looks very special and maserati actually in typical maserati fashion this will be for us 
in about oh. three three years time. <laughs> yeah, if you could wait. If this, you could wait. This is gonna be, It'll be on battery bargains in two years. Watch it. Oh, you want a convertible? Pick one of these up for forty nine nine. Yeah. <laughs> So that yeah. was very special. Oh, and we should probably talk about, I didn't realize it was an official recall until this morning when Dom um, mentioned, but I'd seen the TikTok, the famous TikTok now, uh, from the guy whose silver pedal uh, cover slipped off because the glue wasn't, uh, you know, whatever. Um, but it looks like your Cybertruck, Kyle, has got an official recall now. Uh, have you seen this one? Because the, the silver accelerator pedal cover. Yeah. Also, I've noticed I got to do a video. My Cybertruck has 7,500 miles on it now, and it has wow. turned into a rattle trap. That is, that <laughs> seems like after 7,000 miles, everything just went to shit on the whole car. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Don't get me wrong. I drove it around all day yesterday. I think it's great. I have so much fun driving that damn truck. It's so stupid, but I can't even listen to music now because the whole thing is buzzy. No way. Yeah. It total absolutely wow. and i don't know God. what is up with that so now you got the pedals falling off i don't know oh yeah no it's not so the accelerator pedal if anyone doesn't know is hinged at the bottom not the top unlike other teslas uh, so you have to apply a kind of uh, downward, but also almost upward as you push forward with your foot. And uh, the actual accelerator pedal isn't the silver pedal that you can see that's just a stick on piece of trim uh, and on one guy's car uh, it came off and got stuck in the bulkhead uh, and he had the presence of mind just to hit the brake which overrides the accelerator and um otherwise it's a you know it's a very fast problem to have and um uh, it, i i just thought it was one of a one-off tiktok then nitsa noticed and said they were going to investigate and now now tesla looked like they said that they're going to do a recall but you know musk commented on this and said um and it's like one of those kind of abundance of caution moments of we'll do all the car, the trucks, but we don't think it's a big issue. So, yeah, I there mean, I've go. checked my pedal now and it's it's no issue on mine at the moment. Um, like I pulled really hard on it, too. Yeah. Uh, and just tried to knock it and it's it's glued on perfectly fine. Just and... Get the flex tape guy to come and save you. <laughs> yeah, we should just do a flex tape commercial. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got a stuck Cybertruck pedal. No problem. No flex problem. tape! <laughs> 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 that would be so funny. <laughs> we gotta get you that should guy. do that. Yeah, Kyle. You should <laughs> you should make like a two minute video and put it out just for the fun of it. Like, you know, yeah. I have this problem with my, my truth. But what do I get? And then have the big flex tape. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like my whole front trunk doesn't fit. Flex tape. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You could get a good sponsor if you put flex tape all over the Cybertruck to fix yeah. the squeaky parts and everything. That's, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that's it's good money everything there. Everything squeaks. And I feel like even I hit the brakes in it the other day. And I'm not a Tesla hater. Don't get me wrong. I own three Teslas and I love them. I love a lot about them. But I didn't like the feeling when I hit the brakes in my Cybertruck and my seat moved a little bit yesterday. Ooh, wow. That was not flex a tape. great feeling. Flex but anyway, I'm not getting it fixed. I don't have time. It actually, Motor Trend's using it all next week. So okay. they'll be able to do whatever they need to do with it because Tesla won't loan them one, apparently. Wow. Uh, so really? I was like, I'm friends really? with the Motor guys over there. And I'm like, like the car of the year awards. So car and driver got one. Uh, Dan Neal got one. I was just with Dan Neal. He's awesome, by the way. Uh, yeah, and awesome. a few others got uh, cyber trucks and stuff. And Motor Trend didn't get one from Tesla. So they've done a dual motor, but they're going to do tri-motor stuff. And I was like, oh, well, I have to go to LA next week. I'm driving Acura ZDX. I have a Lotus Amira. I have some other EV programs going on. And I was like, oh, I'll just drive out. You can have the Cybertruck for the week. So they're going to do a bunch of stuff with it. I was like, the I gave them two restrictions. Only charge it to 100% when you absolutely need to for a charging yep. or a range test. And don't launch it with suspension in high. So I don't have, uh, so I at least have half shafts to get home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you other see that? Yeah. Uh, amongst the, uh, the the layoffs, which we won't get into now, but uh, that your uh, your your best friend on X, who's been replying to your tweets, Drew Beglino, has left the company. Yeah, this is quite disappointing what, because what we finally had an in with Tesla. I know right? he, he used to follow you on X. He'd, he'd, you know, you'd make a comment, or Brandon would make a comment. He was re yeah. he was re responding about the Cybertruck charge curve, and I'm like, wow. He's like, w in, in the old days, it, that would be Elon Musk would dive into conversations, and it was you know Elon was genuinely insightful of like, oh. Either new feature suggestions or 
or, or stuff that's coming up. And he's too busy with social media and stuff now. Um, and, and Drew Baglino had taken on. He's been at the company 18 years and um, uh, has decided to, you know, to, to step down. He was there with J.B. Straubel, as, who's the co-founder of Tesla. And um, yeah, real shame that he left. Uh, but I also saw the news this week that uh, Elon Musk now has 35 direct reports from various bits of the business. And I don't know, I think they almost need a layer underneath him. I think they've got is it his name Tom Zhou or Tom Zhu? Um, yeah, from they, China. Uh, they they almost right. need another. I think I said this on a group chat, like a Tim Cook, kind of not a, not a, a you know a man of grey, but a, just a, a not a, a not a pen pusher. I don't know, insulting to Tim Apple, but um, but someone <laughs> just just beneath, just beneath, just right. to like a firefight. Yeah, COO, like a basically. like a bit more of a firefighter. Um, that's a lot of direct reports for someone who's also running. But Tom Zhu, the Chinese uh, <clears throat> CEO, he's awesome. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, he's really cool. I oh, like when, him when a he lot. made like he made Shanghai in a year and um and then got moved over here to fix hopefully well run a bunch of stuff in I say here well, he, uh, in the and, US. And he appreciates the customers, they build things really well. He's like seems like the guy. Mm. Anyway, yeah. sorry, Don. We we carried on in your absence, Don. No, that's, that's fine. Sorry, I don't know what happened here. I, I have fiber internet, so I don't know what happened. Uh, so yeah, the, so this reveals that basically that they produced or, or delivered thirty eight hundred and seventy eight cyber trucks already. Which of course, yeah, that's yeah. the giveaway. That's the tell because the, the earnings call is next week, and there was no way in the world they were going to say how many that they'd made because they even lump oh. three and Y together, and there's no right. way they were going to break out uh, cyber truck US sales. And so that's and a lot of cyber trucks. It's more yeah. than I thought. Three more than eight, a lot of people thought, yeah. 3878 is the number. It's mm -hmm. more than I thought. Yeah. I'm starting to see them all over New Jersey. I've seen two of them on the road. I saw one charging. There's like uh, four of them for rent on Toro. Mm -hmm. around, there's one. I actually have one that I'm going to be renting soon um, at a good price, too. Not too expensive. So yeah. We probably have like half a dozen in like Tallahassee, Florida, of all places. You know, half a dozen cyber truck. Mm. Around well, there. it's a good yee yee South Florida truck. So, you know, you just got to squat <laughs> that thing. You want to yeah, dump not, the rear airbags out. Florida, <laughs> and Florida yeah, was one of the states that Florida, had the early deliveries, I though. Mm. I'm thinking yeah. Panhandle, south of south of, of the United uh, yeah, yeah, States yeah. Oh, of America. Right, right, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just, just outside of <laughs> just outside of the Tallahassee bubble. That's where you'll, you'll see all the jacked up trucks squatting. That's where all, we got the most attention with our cyber truck on the really? race. After that, yeah. no one cared. But oh, South wow. Florida or, or just Florida, the South Southern America, Florida loves the, the cyber yeah. truck. <laughs> um, all right. So real quick, the big product news this week, we should probably mention was that Maserati debuted the Grand Cabrio Fulgore. <laughs> we, no, did we've already talked we, about did it. we did that. We did that. We did that. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're well. done. We're finished. Oh man! I mean, it's all right. oh, man. If anyone's curious on the car, I did a full tour of the hardtop one. Okay, so you can but, watch that. Yeah, so yeah that's a I good. Wasn't that into, yeah. I saw that news this week. You know about the Fulgari, the convertible, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's kind of Maserati's not really a you know a brand for me in the past. But going through all the details, and it's been a while since I looked at the uh, at oh, the other uh, the. Um, the They're not a Christmas brand for you at present either, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> I got news for you. It's like two hundred fifty thousand. Wow. <laughs> is that what it is? Is that the price? Guys, I, I think it's two twenty five. It starts at or something. So yeah, you know, there's you like a fifty page press release. So yeah. um, <laughs> I was, I don't, I might have missed some details last night. I was going, but as I was going through it, I was getting really excited because there's just so much good stuff among this this thing. You know, it's like seven hundred fifty horsepower and. Almost a almost a thousand foot pound of torque, but that's all the same as the hardtop. It is, it is, but I'd forgotten because that was like oh. a, a year ago or something. You know, yeah. it's like and yeah, Maserati's not top of mind for me <laughs> generally. I see a few around town though, but not not the two hundred fifty thousand dollar versions of whatever they sell now. We were going to talk about uh, the latest FSD software, which you've got any good? Um, yeah, so I did a video uh, this week. Uh, Little update, and I, I gave it a provocative title on my on my video. Uh, it, but it fails to impress. Gets dubious and dangerous on on the dude loop. So the dude loop is uh, the drive electric with Dominic kind of loop here in Tallahassee, standard loop where I've tested. I think I have like ten different videos now. Every time I get a software update, I run it through the standard loop that I drive. And uh, this one, so it's a hugely improved over version eleven. But so I've I've got version 3.3.4 right now, and it seems like a regression from 3.3. Um, so it, it did a couple 
like one dubious moves, like sort of the change lanes and halfway there, it changed back again. Like, uh, you know, when I really needed to get over two lanes because it wasn't set up properly. And then it still wasn't over where it needed to be at the very point of the intersection that it had to cross like a bike lane, double solid lines, which it's not really great. Uh, but the big thing really for me was we were going down another road and, uh, the, uh, it didn't recognize, it didn't see a traffic light. It didn't seem to seem to, you know, it was yellow. As we came across the hill, it was yellow. It was definitely going to be red by the time we got there. And it didn't slow down until like the very last minute. I had no, nobody behind me, so I kind of let the car do what it was going to do. But I was just about ready to stomp on the brakes myself because it was about, it felt like it was about to run the light. And yeah, it applied the brakes at the last minute and came pretty hard stop. So it's kind of dangerous because those kind of stops, that's how you get rear-ended in traffic. It's really not what people expect you to do. Well, they would expect you to see the yellow light actually and be slowing much earlier. And if I, if I had a, had traffic around me, I would have disengaged and, and hit it. But uh, yeah, but generally, I mean, the, the software is really good. Uh, it's really impressively improved. And uh, yeah, we're watching going through this is gain street on the screen if you're watching this on youtube it's like kind of like the student uh we have uh, so florida state university is in, is in, the, is in this town and uh, yeah it it occupies a large part of this part of the city so it's always kind of great going down there um yeah so i don't know well, well i'm gonna try it out again there's lots of things with uh with the new fsd update that's you know really greatly improved and things have changed and, and uh yeah, I've got to. I'm going to uh, Abu Dhabi this week or early next week, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to put out some of the videos that I want to do right now. But got to get ready for that. That's going to be really fun. I, I don't know, Kyle. You didn't hear about whether you can, you're going or not yet. Well, I'm definitely not going, but I was thinking maybe of no. sending one of the out of spec guys. But I don't know. I looked at who's going, and it's like nothing that we haven't covered before. Right. So, but, but I'm yeah, that probably you're not like going to do it. So this is like air, land, and sea. Air, yeah, I know. Sea. That's what I was excited and, and about. Like, I don't know if you're people. People don't know, but Kyle is like the biggest airplane geek, flying aviation geek you can imagine. You, you uh, not as big as some out there, but I do love flying. Man, we, we, we were at dinner with a, with somebody who with a pilot, and man, there was a lot of aviation talk. It was great, actually. So this is gonna this place is this event is gonna have a lot of. Um, you know, flying drone, man, man drone, I guess. I don't know how you even pronounce EV tolls, electric vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, this is Archer up on the screen right now. Hopefully we'll have an interview with them up. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to go up, but probably within the next week or so. And they have a really interesting craft that they're bringing to market. And it's, yeah, they've just opened up a, 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 a an office in Washington, D.C., I, I believe. But their their first markets are going to be in, uh, in the Middle East and also, I believe, India. They have some presence. But there's going to be a whole bunch of these companies. And, uh, yeah. And, right, so they might not, I might not get all the FSD testing this week that I want to make or that, that I want to do. But you'll be on the podcast next week from Dubai at the conference. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, that's, that's oh. the plan. Well, yeah. go show us your hotel room. Just bring be, your boots. Better be good. Yeah, <laughs> bring a swimsuit. Oh, right? Yeah, they had a huge... Hip waders, maybe, at this point. Yeah, Jordan says he's uh, willing to take one for the team. <laughs> and, and no, Jordan's busy next week. He's babysitting our truck with Motor Trend. Oh, oh okay. you're sending him. Yeah, this... You're sending him with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Jordan's there to make good sure up. that they don't treat it like a true press car. Oh, yeah, you don't want that. You do not want that. Um, that's cool. All right. Well, look, springtime, uh, April in Dubai is not the end of the world, Dom, so I'm sure you'll have a good... We'll see you next week on the podcast, but maybe I'll be pushing the buttons and and we'll see how you go. Appreciate that. All right. Um, so anything else we want to talk about today? All good. Uh, you know, the pricing for the GMC Sierra is out. That's uh, It was, like, cheaper uh, then they took, I think, it was nine thousand dollars off the original MSRP price, and it's got four hundred and forty or four hundred fifty miles of range. It was four forty. It's identical to Silverado EV. Yep, it's identical, right? Okay. Uh, there was something else about the GMC though that the uh, the Chevy doesn't get. Yeah, the GMC looks better. Well, that too. There was that. Yeah, for sure. But I was thinking there was another. There, there. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with that for next week. But yeah. Maybe that yeah, should... was there any other news this week? Anything happened in the EV world? 
I feel like I've been out of it for most of the week. I'm trying to find an, an email of uh, an invitation to something. So if anyone knows... Martin, are you going to this Abu Dhabi thing? I feel no, like this is no, all no, no. you. No, <laughs> I'd love to go to that. Uh, yeah. So if anyone in the comments knows uh, what Tesla are unveiling on May the 3rd, um, they're doing an event in London. And I'm like, well, is that energy storage? And they're like, no, no, it's something to do with cars. Um, so I've got the invite May the 3rd in London, Tesla event. They won't tell me what it is. I'm like, oh, really? Just ah, Can you bring a plus one? Because I'll be in Europe. I have to be in Germany on the 4th. Oh, okay. So let's go to that on the third together, and we'll see what what they won't tell me what they're launching. Great. So. Oh, I'll just go with you. We'll go have fun. Have some fun. And it's Martin, yeah. I know you've been in contact with my parents, but aren't my yes. parents going to be there around then as well? Around then, I know that your dad is taking a cruise from the terminal that I live near. Um, so I said, well, if you want an, an EV for when you're over here, let me know. I'll get him insured. And um, he said, yep, that sounds good. Like good fun. So they're flying in to Heathrow, which is a couple of hours, maybe uh, maybe Gatwick, I'm not sure, but a couple of hours away from me. So yeah, I'm going to go grab them from the airport and take them down to where they're cruising from just because it's, e it's easier than them trying to sort transfers. So wow, yeah, I'm going to catch so up nice. with out, out of spec Dave as well. Yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, yeah, my parents are great. You'll enjoy them. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, Dave, Dave is always a blast, and, and your mom is great. But uh, but Mark, if that 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 third thing is actually happening, I think yeah. I will go. Yeah, it's off the e it's of the evening, seven p.m. third. So if anyone in the comments knows what they're they're or just maybe, message me maybe privately. It's a virtual but, virtual power grid thing, maybe. Is it yeah, they they doing? do that over. Yeah, they do. Uh, Tesla Energy is a thing over here. So I don't right, know. So we'll find out. It'll be good fun. If not, if that. if nothing else, it'll be good fun to go hang out with Tesla press people who apparently they don't have, but they do. So. But they do in Europe for sure. And I know oh, the yeah. U.S. guy. Uh, we have one in the U.S. And um, the, the guy that I was friends with in Germany left the company. So, like, oh. all the fun stuff that we had planned uh. went with him. <laughs> I was like, but we were going to do uh -huh. Model S, Track Pack, Nürburgring Laps. Like, where did all this happen? And then just yeah. like, oh, sorry, I quit. Trap. Oh, and it could uh. be Model 3 Performance. Actually, someone in the comments says it could be. Could it's be. about the oh, right yeah. timing. Uh, oh, yeah. that was on. So I, that's going to be on my podcast today, um, which is I'm not sure I can even show you a screenshot of it. Um, uh, so on the TeslaMotorsClub.com forum, somebody found the source code of the mm -hmm. Tesla UK website. Right. Um, so I did the same myself. I just did right click and view source. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's all there. So okay. it's um, what are the numbers? What do we need to know? It, Over place 500 horsepower? Place, 500 horsepower, but 0 to 60 placeholder. Track mode V3 um, with uh, adaptive, oh. air sus adaptive air suspension and Whoa, custom code. Whoa, it's got air. Custom, uh, custom uh, software to make track mode V3 hard, super hardcore. But no mention of the word ludicrous. It's all performance. So right. I, I don't know if it's real or not. I, know if, I can't even find a screenshot to show right. you. But um, Yeah, I didn't put yeah. that in the notes today because I... I, I I'm not confident in those numbers, really. You know, yeah. I want, I want, don't want to kick people's hopes up or give the wrong information. I'm so excited for this car. Yeah, so, yeah, so, because uh, I, I don't know what, if I want an Ionic Five <clears throat> N or a new Model Three Performance. Right, that's what I was just thinking <laughs> in my mind. Right, yeah, that's the natural competitor. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it could be that. Well, it's the natural shot. competitor's Model Y performance, but let's be honest. If anyone's really thinking about yeah. buying a performance EV, the shape doesn't matter. You want the spiciest thing for under. You know, seventy right. grand or whatever is right. reasonable mm. for something like this. Well, I can't yeah. find it now, but we'll do it yeah, next week I, on the show. I would be really surprised if it has air. I would be really excited if it has adaptive damper. Mm. Right, right, right. The Fulgari has the adaptive well, damper. A lot more likely and air to be that. Yeah. I just throw that out there. Uh, Fulgari, yeah, but <laughs> that's just a lane. I mean, come on. You haven't driven that, right? No. But okay. I've spent enough time with one that I'm just like... Oh, really? You spent some time with one? Yeah, I did a whole video on it. Is it driving? No. Oh, okay. But okay. You, you, you don't... Some some cars, you understand the, what they were trying to go for, and right. it's not performance. Right. No, no. It's like a Grand Touring kind of it's thing. It's a GT car. Right. Yeah. But it's a lot of... But with some performance, you know, it's got a lot oh, of grunt. It's got to be quick, and it's right. going to be it's super quick. drifty. They say Listen. it's drifty. The H point is actually super low on that car. They say it's the lowest. It right. So I, I know that's something that you, you like. I think they use the same cells as Tycon. Oh, interesting. Okay. As V1 Tycon, not the new Tycon. Right, right. All right. So I think that brings us to the end of our show. 
if you have any questions or comments, please leave, leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice. Don't forget, if you like the show, please give us a thumbs up, click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications so you can catch all of these midweek specials that we do, including, thanks for mentioning that actually uh, earlier, Martin, the Battery Bargains shows that we do every week. Those are great fun. And I got some ideas to make them even more fun coming up. Um, right, so yeah, thank you all very much for joining us and we'll see you all again very soon.